Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to our discussion on social mobility. I'm Owen County, a director with BIE and also our EDI lead. We began hosting these webinars with the onset of COVID coinciding with Black Lives Matter coming more to the fore. And we knew that our BIE community wanted to learn more about what they could do in their businesses. This is our sixth large scale EDI event, with the most recent last summer being around creating a workplace which was inclusive to those with a disability. For those of you who don't know about BIE, we're an executive, executive recruitment firm that builds leadership and enables change through a combination of executive search, interim management and transformation expertise across five broad market functions. EDI is a huge focus for us at BIE, so we're delighted to be able to host today's discussion for you. Our panel discussion will build on our first social mobility webinar from around about this time last year to help us understand how the conversation has evolved and also what needs to be done to improve social mobility in your businesses. Our panelists today come from diverse backgrounds and experiences, and we'll be sharing some fascinating stories from their own companies, but also with a personal dimension. The discussion will last around 45 minutes, and after that, we'll have time for some questions from the audience. Do please submit your questions using the Q&A function at any time during the webinar, and we'll endeavor to get to as many as possible at the end. Today's session will be recorded and shared afterwards, along with a write-up of key themes uh, for creating a more inclusive workplace. Without further ado, I'll ask our two speakers today to introduce themselves. Joanne, could I ask you to go first? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Owen. Hi, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. I'm Joanne Conway. I'm Head of Diversity, Equity and Inclusiveness at EY, so Ernst & Young. I've um, been with EY for about 16 years now, starting off in finance before um, taking on uh, DE&I for the last 10 years in a, in a number of roles. Um, so firstly, in a global landscape and in the UK for the last four years. Uh, in addition to that, I am at the moment doing a doctorate on the topic of privilege in relation to race, gender and class. So this is something that is particularly interesting uh, to me from a personal perspective as well. So thanks for having me. Thanks, Joanne. Darren, over to you. Thanks, Owen. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Darren Burns. I'm the Director for Diversity and Inclusion for the Timson Group, um, and I'm also head of the Timson Foundation. Um, my kind of primary work within the business, certainly for the last 12 years, has been to um, essentially manage the employment um, and retention of people who face barriers to employment. Um, and what we're particularly well known for within the Timson Group is giving um, ex-offenders or prison leavers um, opportunities. More recently, we've so, sort of to, decided to sort of broaden our scope um, and help more marginalised people back into work. Um, so some of the groups that we're helping into employment now include um, care leavers, um, neurodiverse people, disabled people, military veterans, refugees, as well as the, the work that we're doing with ex-offenders. Um, and similarly to Joanne, I'm stud um, currently studying for um, a master's degree in applied criminology in Cambridge. So um, I feel your pain, Joanne. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, esteemed um, academics among us today uh, to be part of our discussion. Um, it'd be great for us as well to have some audience uh, involvement or participation in this. Um, and for that, or with that in mind, I'd like to ask you a question. We'll be using the Slido function uh, for this. So if you could go to slido.com and enter the, the hashtag BIE, uh, we will we'll be able to uh, sort of see the the, um, the responses coming through. Last year, we had Sarah Atkinson, the CEO of the Social Mobility Foundation, talk to us um, in our first social mobility webinar. And she was telling us how socioeconomic background can be measured. In a way, social class is a little bit more subjective. Uh, so for instance, some people may feel working class, even though that may not necessarily map onto their sort of socioeconomic background. So measuring socioeconomic background is a more inclusive method. And this is one that we now have as part of our diversity monitoring forms, which we ask all shortlisted candidates here at BIE to complete. It'd be interesting to get your responses on this question today. As Sarah told us last year, we can actually ask one of three questions on this. What did your parents do? What type of school did you go to? And also, were you eligible for free school meals? irrespective of even having claimed those. 
If we think that social mobility is the change of moving up or down relative to your parents, the degree to which people's socioeconomic circumstances change over a lifetime and across generations, the question that we're putting to you today is, what was the occupation of your main household earner when you were aged about 14 years old? And there's multiple choice on that one, but it'd be interesting for us to, to get your thoughts on it um, and, and see, what, uh, see what our group says today. We asked a slightly narrower question last year, and I think 42% of you came back saying that you viewed yourself as coming from a lower socioeconomic background. But as I say, that was, was actually a slightly narrower question. Joanne, uh, if I could maybe start with you. Um, EY, uh, obviously a very large and international business. I believe that you have measures around wanting more gender and ethnic diversity within the business. How can we maybe look to replicate this with social mobility? Yeah, thank you. I think um, it's definitely learnings from a race and gender perspective. So from an EY perspective, we looked at, um, from a DEI perspective, we did a strategy refresh in about 2018. And one of the things that we looked at was how can we really um, diversify our representation, particularly at the most senior level within the organization. So for us, it, that was at partner level. And we looked at the two areas that we were most underrepresented and, and where we could measure that. So that was race and gender because we had enough data to be able to see where we are, but also where we wanted to get to. So we set ourselves ambitious targets in 2018 to double the representation of our partnership from 10% to 20% um, ethnic minority, of which 15% would be black, and 20% to 40% women by 2025. So setting those targets has really helped us focus the minds. It's helped us to be, be able to measure progress. So I really think that the targets not quotas and there's a difference. It's, it's always about the right person in the right role and making sure that you've got your pipeline in place um, to set everybody up for success and create that equity, which will then feed through into your conversion to senior roles. But, the, um, but we also focus on the culture and the ways of working and our systems, which is important. So it's not enough to just set targets. You really need to think about well, how are we going to communicate this? Why are we doing that? How, what are going to be the real change behaviours and ways of working that we can actually make, meet these targets in a meaningful way? So we've actually had more progress in terms of the representation in our partnership in the last three years than we have had in the last 10 years. So it, it's clearly making, making a difference. So I think there's lessons to be learned from social economic diversity some of the challenges that we have as well is, is, is we're not there yet in terms of the, the data of what people have shared with us, the personal data. So we can continue on that journey. On, on that and, and trying to sort of broaden the socioeconomic background of people coming into EY, is there sort of a minimum educational attainment, you know, that you would expect for people joining EY? Or do you look to school leavers as well as, as those who've maybe more traditionally gone to Oxbridge or a red brick university? Yeah, so we have we have a, a mix. So we do have a school leavers programme. We have a, a, a graduates programme as well. And then we also have our EY Foundation, which is our, our charity. And they work with some of the most underserved uh, individuals across the UK. We also, um, a good few years ago, must be like 10 years ago now, perhaps we changed our um, what we needed in terms of the, the degree. So I know previously organisations asked for a minimum of a, of a 2-1, so a first to be able to, to, to go through the process. We actually removed that um, quite a while ago and that, that has really made a difference in terms of enabling us to get access to, to more talent. Yeah. And, and, and I suppose it just even when that talent joins the business as well, you know, perhaps for people from that lower socioeconomic background, how do you ensure that they can thrive within the business and, and I guess sort of come to come to work and be them full selves? Yeah, I mean, that that's that's one of the, the key things for for everybody is about that. You know, it's not enough to, to hire and get in the door, but actually what's your experience and how is how do you navigate the organization? One of the things that I've seen, um, particularly from the research that I've been doing is around the, 
um, the real need from people to want to belong, but also to want to be recognized for their unique identity. So to show up, to not have to assimilate. So in order for me to belong, I don't, I want to fit into a team, but I don't want to have to change who I am to do that. And that's the really fine balance. So we do a lot of work around uh, inclusion. We have a strong when we belong campaign. So a lot of storytelling um, in terms of that inclusiveness. And we have seven networks in over 30 communities, which are, are thriving and, and provide a really great opportunity for our people. And then the other thing I'd say, which is really important is we look at our employee life cycle to identify any barriers that may be in place for some groups over others, because people want to feel like they belong, but actually that, that equity and sense of belonging will come when people feel that they have that, that equity right throughout the employee cycle. Yeah. Um, it, it, I suppose, yeah, as you say, it's sort of that, that full journey through. Um, yeah. uh, da Darren, if I could turn to you just to, to set the scene maybe a little bit from the, from the Timson side. Um, our initial discussion with Timson's was with, uh, with, I guess, your boss, James Timson. Um, and he was saying to us that, in his view, you're not a diverse employer if you don't hire people with a criminal record. Um, and I believe it's what one sixth of the British population have a conviction greater than a, a driving infringement. But what was the catalyst for for Timson becoming a leader in hiring people from prison? Um, I, th I think it started um, by accident. James Timson was invited to a local prison in the northwest with a number of other business leaders. And um, James was shown around that prison by a serving inmate, a, a young guy named Matt. Um, and James really liked Matt. Um, Matt was very intelligent, very articulate. Um, had a big personality, and James thought that Matt would make a great addition to the, the Timson business. Um, so James being James, he slipped, slipped Matt a business card and said, Matt, when you get released, um, give me a call and I'll see if he can give you a job. Um, and he did. A few months later, James was contacted by Matt. Um, and I think James's initial sort of thoughts were to kind of sneak Matt into the business and say, Matt, for God's sake, don't tell anybody you're from prison. It, it will cause chaos. Um, but James didn't do that. James kind of pinned his colours to the mast and thought, well, do you know what? We've got this great candidate like Matt from one sort of small prison in the Northwest. We're really proud of what we do and we're going to be on board with it. So James announced to the whole business that um, obviously we'd employed somebody from prison and that we were going to be doing a lot more of it. Um, and because it went so well, um, James decided at that moment to sort of proactively recruit um, ex-offenders into the Timson business. So we're very proud to say that we're now the largest employer of people with convictions in the UK. Um, approximately 12% of our workforce are made up of people who we've either directly recruited from custody or you have an offending background um, and it works very well and um, we are very spoiled because we're an owner-occupied business and because James Timpson our CEO is very personally sort of passionate about um, rehabilitation and prison reform um, it's just very much embedded within our culture so it's completely normal to us and has been now since 2002 to work with ex-offenders so much so that if anybody was to go into any of our stores be it Timson, Max Spielman or Johnson or even any of our sort of pubs or restaurants and ask any of our colleagues there if they've ever worked with anybody from prison or any ex-offenders or foundation colleagues as we refer to them and um, the answer might be well yes i'm from the foundation or yeah we had sally or we had john from the prison they were here last week they've moved on now and been promoted so it's just a completely normal part of our business um but if we could just touch on the reasons why we do it the, the, the main reasons why we we employ ex-offenders so successfully and we're, we're sort of the very much seen as the sort of pioneers and the, the, the standard bearers in the UK um, is because the obvious benefits, which are split into two main groups of reasons. So the first group being the, the kind of societal reasons. Um, for us, it's, it's, it makes perfect sense. Reoffending is reported to cost the UK taxpayer £16 billion a year. So anything that we can do as an organisation to sort of reduce that taxpayer burden and get people back into gainful employment makes perfect sense. Um, employment is, is a key factor to reduce reoffending. Um, official statistics state that 61% of prison leavers will reoffend within two years of leaving custody, and that is reduced to 19% if people have full-time employment. So there's clear evidence there that employment is a key factor. It's certainly not the only factor because first and foremost, people need somewhere safe to live. They need a support network, family, friends, people to care for them, people to love them. But after that, employment is that all-important factor. So for us, it's just a no-brainer by helping people um, to stop committing crime and break that offending cycle and, and, and give them jobs and help them into employment. Everybody wins. Um, the taxpayer wins because the £16 billion burden is reduced. Um, offenders win because they're not being sent to prison to serve long sentences. Offenders, families, partners, children, they win because they're not losing loved ones 
But I think more importantly than that, we all win as a society because ultimately um, our communities are safer, fewer crimes are, are being committed and there are fewer victims of crime. Um, but perhaps the real reason why we're, we're so big on, on ex-offender employment is because it's good for business. Um, people often confuse things and they think we're, we're a charity, we're not, we're a, we're a commercial um, business, um, a really successful business. Um, and if employing ex-offenders wasn't good for business, um, we wouldn't do it and I'd probably be out of a job. Um, the, 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 the reality is, is that um, the ex prison leavers and ex-offenders that we recruit um, often stay with us longer. They're statistically more honest than people that we recruit for more regular streams. Um, they're very hard working, they're very loyal, um, and they bring with them a great deal of sort of personal resilience. And our sort of thought behind that is anyone who can navigate their way through a, a sort of tough prison sentence and come out standing on the other side, anything that we can throw at them as an employer, they can pretty much do it standing on their heads. Um, so it's been a real good fit for our business. And again, um, we get to recruit lots of very talented people that usually wouldn't consider working for Timson. And there are lots of very impressive people in custody who fall on file of the law who just need that second chance, who just need that opportunity. Um, and they're often very grateful and, and turn out to be great colleagues. Good. Um, in, in, a, in a way, you know, with, with all of that that you are doing there at Timson and, and our discussion today being more focused on social mobility, do you think it's it's tenuous to sort of link the work that Timson does to to social mobility in hiring people from prison, you know, not necessarily being linked to sort of class or socioeconomic background? I think that's a really good question. Um, and I think you could be forgiven for thinking that the work we do with ex-offenders is completely separate from social mobility. Um, but I think it's linked. And the reason I think it's linked is when you consider when people um, get sentenced to, to um, a, a prison, um, they often lose everything. So these people can often be quite successful. They could be professionals. They could be educated. They could have had good lives, properties, partners. Usually when people go into custody, they get stripped of absolutely everything. So they will often lose their home, their partner, their job, the sort of self-confidence, um, any sort of status they have. So it's a great way of sort of levelling people in a way. Um, so what we often find is that when we go into custody, we will meet lots of former sort of high-flying professionals who fall and follow the law for a, a myriad of reasons. Um, essentially, when they get released, they have to start again. 70% um, of employees openly admit to discriminating against those with convictions. Um, so these people are going to find it really tough to sort of build their way back up to anything, um, a life, anything like it was before they went into custody. So what we're able to do is give them that opportunity, give them that lifeline. So, yeah, I do think... I think tenuous is the wrong word. I think it's linked. I think the work we do around social mobility is very much linked in, in the work that we do with the foundation as well. Yeah, no, thanks for that. Um, I suppose just even thinking about the word linked and, you know, sort of crossing over to, to other parts, perhaps Joanne, um, do you see social mobility and sort of perhaps how it intersects with class or, or sort of, you know, gender, race, et cetera, um, as being sort of quite a, a pivotal piece here when we look at social mobility in a broader sense? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I, firstly, I think the, the work that Darren, you're doing in Tim Sims is, is incredible. There's a um, work that EY has started to do called EY Outreach that was founded by an incredible guy called Yeshua Carter. And I had the pleasure of going to a um, prison in Birmingham to meet some of the young offenders that, who were going through this this rehabilitation program and the whole point of it is about working with these young people to get them back into paid employment and back into this society and I was so impressed with their um, just their, their 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 confidence their capability their um, their resilience and and how they were really, really um, hungry for a second chance. And I think quite often we're too quick to, to you know, add stereotypes to people and make assumptions. So I think that that, that work is, is really important. And I think that, to your point, um, Owen, around that being socially mobile and, and the class piece, there is research that tells us that, you know, as you move up or down through social mobility, so for some it is about, you know, not having that equitable start at the beginning and really you know working your way up and becoming socially mobile but for others where they have been quite successful or they have been privileged or or, or had that and they lose that they still actually the research shows go through the same identity crisis so whether you're moving up or moving down it is a really um 
you know, it has a real impact on mental health, on individuals' sense of self, of, of who they are and of how they how they um, just even navigate the world. So that's a really important, a really important part of it. So I think we need to be talking about the class more in organisations, particularly some of the more prestige organisations where it can still be taboo. So I've seen that more and more now, particularly in the last couple of years, it's much more front and centre. But uh, yeah, we, we need we definitely need to do to do more um, around that, and then that that will help alleviate some of that pressure on individuals, but also really accelerate some of the work that that we can do um, to break down some of those barriers because we're missing out on talent when we don't. Yeah, yeah. Do you think some of this is, I suppose, even people talking about their own experiences, perhaps even from a, a sort of broader allyship sort of perspective? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's one of the things that that I do. So there's been a couple of like things that I've spoken about, and I did um, a, a piece for for EY as well around share my own story, personal stories coming from a lower social economic background. And and while that was um, it's quite difficult to do because you don't want to like come across as like for me, but actually the feedback that I get from people is I didn't know that people like me could be successful or could sit in those roles or could sit on boards and, and be part of those conversations so I think that's a really important part of it and you know for me I left school did my GCSEs went straight into work didn't go to university and and um, here I am doing a doctorate but I've done that through working full-time doing an open university degree going to night school to do my master's and and you know it, it's possible it's just not always the same route um but that but but that navigation of being able to come into a professional services organization and not have the cultural capital of knowing how to navigate that I wouldn't even have known what the word cultural capital was I didn't even know what accountancy was there was never any conversations around career progression so for me the part of the role that I'm in and, and now that I have this platform is about really making it more accessible and having the conversations because the more people that can hear it and actually have the opportunity and and it's not about everybody wanting to become socially mobile you know there's a there's a misconception sometimes that everybody aspires to be middle class and that's not true I'm really proud of my my roots and you know I desperately try to hang on to those um but, but we sh we should have the option and that's what I want to make sure is that everybody has choices and at the moment our society is not set up in a way that means that everybody has it has has the same choices or the same access to opportunities and then that creates this unfairness and distribution of, of, of where people are. Um, I think you mentioned uh, when we were chatting before that uh what EY we're doing a piece around is it charting the course as well for yeah. uh, around sort of that notion of of sort of helping people with that social capital uh, side or sort of working working in on on that side, uh, which is which is interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's a whole piece of research on that around knowing we'd um, got an, an sponsored a piece of research on that. This was particularly around how ethnic minority individuals um, navigate the organization, but there's definitely, you know, you can see crossovers because a lot of it is around masking and, you know, not having access to information. And, and it comes down to, you know, when you start in your role or in your, um, in a more junior position, it's often about the technical skills. So the knowing what, and that, that's quite usually evenly distributed. People have access to the kind of what they need to do in terms of, of learning. So the knowing what is really important. But as you progress, actually, it's not it's it's knowing what then and it's knowing how and then it's who knowing who. So as you kind of move up through the organization, the kind of things that you need that are not technical, that are more around. Well, that's just how we do things around here. Well, how do you know that? You know, if, if you if you're looking in a process or a policy um, and it's not there and if you don't have access to those shadow processes through your networks or through your life experience, then that puts you at a disadvantage. So there's a there's a work that we're doing around that, around well, what do we need to do to change the systems and the processes? And because it's not about changing minority groups, it's not about you know asking people to assimilate. This is about what we need to fundamentally change as organizations to, to create that equity that doesn't exist.
Darren, if I go back to back to you, just even on linking in on on that one, in terms of I suppose joining joining a business, you know, you mentioned that what is it, twelve percent of of Timson's workforce have an offending background. Who's the who's the most senior person in the business with that offending background or a prison background? Yeah, I think rather um, embarrassingly, I mean, it's going to be me. Um, so I'm, um, as I mentioned before, I'm the director for EDI. I, I manage the Timson Foundation as well. Um, but um, 12 years ago, um, I was in custody. Um, so in, in a former life, I was a detective inspector for Merseyside Police. Um, I committed a, a, an offence, um, which led to me being in prison for four years. Um, a drugs offence, um, certainly not something I'm proud of, a huge regret, it always will be. Um, and when I was um, sentenced, I, I lost everything. I had a really tough time in prison, as you can imagine. Um, I lost my partner, I lost my house, lost my pension, I lost my savings, lost my dignity, self-respect. Um, and more importantly than anything, I think I lost my status as a sort of trusted individual within society. Um, so it was a tough time for me personally. And I honestly thought, well, what am I going to do now? Who's going to employ me? Um, people are going to assume that I'm, I'm dangerous, I'm untrustworthy, inherently dishonest. Um, who's going to give me an opportunity? And there was a, a long time when I was inside when I thought, I just don't know how life is, is going to work out for me when, when I eventually get released. Um, thankfully for me, um, I was given an opportunity to work for Timson on a scheme called Rottle, which stands for Release on Temporary Licence. And this is where, in the last six months of my sentence, I was able to come out and work for Timson in one of the Thai Street um, stores. I was, um, I was essentially taught to repair shoes and cookies quite badly, so apologies if I've ever repaired anybody's shoes. Um, but once I'd done that, I eventually got released from custody. I um, went to meet with James Timson, told James about my kind of experience, um, and said to James, I would love to help in the foundation if my experience would be of any use in terms of time I'd spent in the police. I mean, I was in the police for sort of 11, 12 years in some of the, the toughest areas of Merseyside. So anything I can offer to help break that offending cycle and, and, and help people move away from that sort of lifestyle into employment, I'd be very happy to help. Um, and I was very fortunate in that James gave me that opportunity. But just to go back to what Joanne was saying before, um, this, the type of organisation that I, I'm fortunate to be a part of is a, a genuinely and quite organically a, a, an inclusive um, workplace. Um, when I remember coming out on, on Rottle that very first day, I was absolutely convinced that people were going to look down the nose at me, people were going to judge me, people weren't going to speak to me at all, it was going to be ignored. Um, and the complete opposite was true. I was made to feel welcome from day one. Um, I certainly wasn't asked to, to speak about my experiences or anything like that, but I was very much made to feel like part of the team. And me being a, a, an ex-offender has never been brought up by anyone in the business as a negative. Um, in fact, quite the opposite sometimes because of the experience I've had, I've been able to help other people who, who've been in, in, in similar experiences. Um, but yeah, we, we pretty much... Um, we, we, we do good things in terms of ex-offenders and other marginalised groups. And interestingly, what we find is that lots of people who've been in custody um, have also faced other disadvantages. They might be care experience, they might be neurodiverse, they might be military veterans, which is not necessarily a sort of disadvantage, but it can present its own sort of set of problems. Um, and by helping ex-offenders, we're also helping lots of these other groups as well. So for me personally, um, I was very fortunate um, and I've been treated well pretty much from day one, really, um, by the Timpson Group. Yeah. Uh, well, look, thanks for sharing that so openly with us today. Um, I guess it's, I suppose it's linking back to the fundamentals of of what James Timpson was trying to achieve from his first meetings there in prison. And uh, do, do, I suppose, do you see that in a way with Timpson uh, and your experience being a, you know, a, a, a light within within the broader business? Do you see that as a way of almost being closer to the communities you serve as well in a broader sense? Um, and I know you mentioned, I guess, other other pieces around, you know, neurodiverse or other marginalised communities, but just being closer to the, the broader communities you serve? I think it is. And I think for, for the first time ever, I mean, James Timpson is quite prevalent on social media. And what we've we found over, over, over recent years is that we've got a huge amount of support. So when we first started doing this back in 2002, we had lots of adverse press. So there was, um, there was silly sort of alliteration type sort of headlines in the Daily Mail, sort of killer cobblers, cookies and all this nonsense. And um, we were kind of pilloried for it, saying it's ridiculous, you're teaching burglars and thugs to cut house keys, and it, it, it's, a, it's the wrong thing to do. But what we found over more recent years is that we've got the overwhelming support of the public, and because we offer people um, these opportunities, and because, as you said quite rightly before, 
There are 13 million people in the UK with a conviction more serious than a driving offence. There are currently 86,000 people in prison in England and Wales. So people who go to custody are out there. The, the families are affected by this. We sit next to them on a the tube. We sit next to them in, in, in coffee shops, on a bus, etc., etc. These These people exist. People do make mistakes or make a bad choice in life and do end up in prison or certainly fall foul of the criminal justice system. So I, I think... The, the reason we get so much support is, is because we, we do offer these sort of second chances. And I think you'd be surprised how many people's lives out there have been touched by the criminal justice system in some way. So it's been a huge benefit for us. And whenever James sort of um, posts something positive on social media about the work we do, um, he, he gets a huge amount, thousands of comments um, from, from members of the public saying that well, we will only ever use Timson services because of your inclusive um, approach to employment. We think it's amazing what you do, et cetera, et cetera. So for the first time ever now, we've seen a real sort of positive in our bottom line because of our inclusive recruitment. Yeah, good, good. Um, no, it's a fascinating story. Um, go, going back to, to you, Joanne, um, and you mentioned earlier as well your um, the studies you're doing at the moment around you know class and privilege, et cetera. How are you translating that back into what you're doing at EY? Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a good it's a good question. There is it. So I'm halfway through, and um, one of the reasons that I was really interested in privilege of, of how it came about was I come from, um, as I said, like a background where I lacked privilege, and you know there were there were so many things that happened throughout my life where you know not getting called for jobs because of the address that I had on my CV, the area you know the estate that I lived in you know taxis wouldn't go there you know we couldn't get takeaways it was like nobody would come into the estate unless they actually lived there so there's loads of um discriminations and ways in which I lacked privilege but when I started to really get more into this role uh, as a DEI practitioner and start to unpack my own privilege that was quite an uncomfortable thing for me to actually as somebody that comes from a working class background and really felt you know well how can I be privileged because I've had all of these things happen to me and actually you know I, I don't have privilege but as I started to do more kind of self-discovery work and deeper work in this that you know it was really clear to me that actually I have loads of privilege firstly by being white in in a society where you know when I walk into a room particularly at senior leadership level people more often than not look like me people that are in in a lot of power across um organizations and and politics and and things like that I, you know i'm represented in a way that others are not um i'm physically able-bodied you know i am of a non-visible faith i am straight there are things that i can do and navigate without having to think about so i have so much privilege but actually i still have lacked privilege and there are still areas in my life that i don't have privilege and when I started to talk to people about this in the workplace, there was often a, um, there could sometimes be a defensiveness around that. And I noticed that when I said, say, well, you know, how, how do you recognise that you have privilege and how can you use that privilege to help kind of break down some of these systemic barriers that exist? And, and sometimes the conversations were, well, I don't, I'm not privileged. I've worked really hard for what I've got. You know, the, 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 so that made me really interested in and unpack it and think, wow, this is really interesting. I wonder what's going on here. Um, I'm not sure I, you know, starting a doctorate was a big, a big part of that. I'm now locked in, into it. I'm halfway through, so I can't back out, so I have to keep going. But it is fascinating. What it's helped me to do is things like that. When I, when I ask questions and I talk about privilege in the workplace, I will start with, you know, tell me about where you've lacked privilege. Tell me, share, because we all lack privilege. Privilege is a social construct, so it changes in the situations that we're in. It changes throughout our lifetime. Um, you know, we know that people can often be diagnosed with a disability much later on in life. So where you had privilege before being able-bodied, you can then no longer have that privilege. So um, being able to talk about it and allow people to, to really share where they've lacked privilege, understand that they still, they still have had that experience and it's valid. But at the same time that they have privilege allows them to be much more open to thinking, OK, well, let's look at these processes and understand how does this how does this perhaps advantage me and people like me? And how do I make sure that we create something that is fair for everybody? Um, so that's why and that's kind of how I'm bringing it into the workplace. So it's it's a 
it's a very emotive topic and a very interesting one, but I, I'm fascinated by it. Yeah, no, thanks. And actually, just uh, sort of on that, I'm seeing a couple of the questions come through, um, and they perhaps have a slight link, so I might even sort of go to them now as opposed to waiting till the end. Uh, but uh, one person is asking um, around, you know, the starting point for when many sort of consider inclusion uh, and, and really sort of people assuming that maybe organisations aren't attracting those from marginalised parts of society. And what they're thinking is that, well, OK, what happens once that marginalized applicant actually enters a process? Um, you know, is there something to be done here in terms of sort of thinking about, um, you know, the looking at the CV, maybe more blind or perhaps is there unconscious bias training that might need to be done uh, in this to, to, to sort of think from a broader socioeconomic point of view, how we can maybe help help people to, to sort of break into that workplace in the first place? Um, and again, similar linked to that as well. Somebody else is asking as well: Can we can we progress on from screening on the basis of grades um, for graduate and apprenticeship schemes, given that those grades are actually so heavily influenced by school class size, tutor support, etc. That somebody has had. I don't know. What's your, what's your your thought on both of those? Perhaps maybe Joanne first, but Darren as well from Timpsons. I know you sort of both probably come at it from slightly different angles. Yeah, thank you. I think so from the from the recruitment place and, and talking about training and, and I think um so there's a couple of things. One is that we have training in place um which is with an organization that really looks to do that. So so helps to people to recognise where they have bias because we all we all have, have bias at, at any one moment in time. We have about 11 million things going through our head, 11 million, and 99% of that process is unconscious. So we all have, have bias, conscious or, or otherwise. Um, the, and this, this training that we, we get all of our hiring managers, anybody that goes through the recruitment process to, to do this training, and it is linked to um, specifically around recruiting, hiring, decision-making for race, gender, and class, like social mobility. So there is that bit and, and the training is quite intuitive. So you it will give you an individual report back and then you can go and do it again in six months time and, and see if, if you've changed in terms of, so it will tell you where you have bias and, and what you can do to um, eradicate that. We also have a tool that we use it, like a methodology called preference tradition requirement. And that's any decisions that are being made, particularly around recruitment, thinking about, is this your personal preference? Are you picking this individual because they're like you? And, and we know that people have a tendency to, to do that. Is it traditionally because they've come from this background or because they've been in this area or are you really focusing on the requirements of the role? So it's a mixture of training tools, but ultimately it comes down to behaviour. So it's constantly looking at um, how decisions are being made and also looking at data. So we are an accountancy firm, so we have access to a lot of data. So we look at everything within ethnicity. So when we look at things, we look at from a gender perspective, but we also look at it from an ethnicity perspective. So not just ethnicity in comparison to white, but actually within that, so black, white, Chinese, mixed, um, Asian, and, and, and so on, to make sure that are there any particular gaps that are existing for that. So that's what we're doing, but more, more to do. And then in terms of taking away things from, from a recruitment perspective, we apply contextualized recruitment. So um, I don't have time to go into it all here, but if you have a look at contextualized recruitment, there's some really good stuff on the Social Mobility Commission, but that allows you to look at individuals' um, grades in comparison to their school. So if you got an A in, in a school that was, you know, in a private school where most people were getting A's and I got a B in a school where most people were getting D's, then I would be viewed, that would come into that, it would contextualise in terms of my environment. And, and that's a fair way, I think, of doing that. It levelled the, the playing field a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. D Darren, how do you guys see that in, in Timson? We're completely different businesses, Owen, as we yeah. discussed. I mean, obviously, Timson are a service retailer. We've been about on the high street since 1865. And in lots of ways, we're sort of fairly old school, which is kind of part of our charm. Um, but I think what we've we've done, I think we've, we've wrongly assumed that we'd sort of, we've ticked every ED&I box that we needed to do because of the work that we did with the foundation. 
Um, but that's that's not the case. Um, we've only been looking at, at ED and I aside from the foundation for the, properly for the last sort of two years. Um, and we're, we're really passionate about it, and it's certainly something that James Timson is, is personally really interested in, and absolutely um, in, insisting that we're going to make huge improvements. So, um, because we've been only looking at it for a short time, the, the, the current work that we're doing is essentially training our hiring managers. So for us, it's all about the, the recruitment practices. Um, I often used to cringe because when people used to talk about Tim's and Tim's and how we employ people, it would be that we employ people with big personalities. And obviously we all know that's very subjective. Uh, it, it causes a, a sort of lots of sort of potential problems and, and can potentially mean that great people aren't going to be able to, to get the jobs because of the way we used to interview them, we used to, we used to consider um, applicants for our vacancies. Um, but I'm pleased to report that we are making changes. Um, we've commissioned um, a, a large piece of work at the moment whereby um, following this training, we're going to look very closely at the sorts of people that we're employing um, to make sure that there's no sort of um, either um, intentional bias or, or otherwise um, by our hiring managers. Um, but we are very serious about it and, and we are making improvements. Yeah, no, thank, thank you. Um, and per, perhaps just, uh, again, a question for, for both of you um, and perhaps Darren, while, while you're on here, do you think has the pandemic, um, and I guess, more recently, you know, inflation, cost of living crisis, global economic uncertainty. Has that actually made the route to improving social mobility more challenging? Or actually has it opened up sort of new avenues to actually improve that? I, I think for us, um, particularly with the work that we do within the criminal justice system, it, it's been strangely quite beneficial. Um, so I spend lots of my time helping other businesses to recruit people with convictions or, or prison leavers and for the last 12 years it's been quite a tough sell for some of the reasons I've already mentioned in, in terms of people will wrongly assume that those pe people who've, who've got convictions are either inherently dishonest and trustworthy are going to be troublesome difficult to manage etc um, and it's been quite quite a hard sell often what we found is that organizations will tick that all important sort of CSR box and say okay well we'll have you the sort of token ex-offender to come in, it'll, it'll be great to sort of soften our profile, but they've not really done it for the right reasons. What we're finding now, because of the sort of uh, labour shortages brought on by Brexit and the pandemic, um, all of a sudden we've got a huge queue of employers who are desperate for people um, saying, please, can you help us to recruit um, people from prison or people who are still serving custodial sentences? Um, and what they're not able to do is to sort of um, develop a proper risk assessment. They're not able to put processes in place or they're not even... Um, kind of all favoured the terminology and language, which is kind of accepted. Um, so we've been helping them along the way with that. So the argument is, is that often some of these big employers who are now looking to recruit from these more marginalised groups, you might not be necessarily doing it for the right reasons, but it will still have a really positive effect and they'll move the agenda forward anyway. Um, so our hope is, is that in a few years' time, it, it will be more normalised in the workplace to, to have somebody with a conviction. Yeah, thank you. Um, Joanne, sort of in a a large professional services firm, do you see, you know, these these uh, sort of economic conditions, cost of living crisis, post-COVID, et cetera, um, potentially having, you know, an advantage in terms of improving socio socioeconomic um, diversity in the workplace, be that sort of the ability for people to perhaps work remotely if that's if that's to be a benefit as well? Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the, there's so many ways for every for every example that you can think of of where it's improved it, there'll be another, you know, and every individual's circumstance is different. So I think in terms of even practically um, from a travel perspective, you know, there's a cost saving. If you typically travel in every day and you've got cost and you don't have to do that anymore, then, then, then those kind of things definitely are a benefit. And it depends on the organisation that you, that you work for. Um, but I do think, you know, for some... If you're still living at home, and this isn't just from a social economic diversity perspective, but for for, for different communities and different groups, you know, people that live in um, intergenerational families, working from home is not as, as easy. So when some organisations are now saying we encourage you to work from home two, three days a week, that's not actually feasible for everybody. So I think that the, the most important thing to think about with organisations is there isn't a one size fits all and, and things should always be fluid. They should always be taken into account that the individuals are do have their own circumstances and, and what works for you doesn't necessarily work for for everybody and that's part of my role in 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 dni is that when you know leaders are making decisions that i'm there to really 
disrupt and, and interrupt and, and, you know, make sure that all of our communities are reflected and any of those key things are being made. But so I do I do think there's opportunities to um to for, for progress and improvement. But I also think, you know, separately to that, from going right back to school leavers, you know, that, that that's where we see the impact and we're going to see that for years to come. We know that that children from um underserved backgrounds have been disproportionately disadvantaged from this and 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 that's where we need to invest invest more in terms of that with our, with our young people because that we're going to see that that impact as we move forward through the next generations okay ah, thanks uh thanks for that um and one, one another question again coming through from the audience is from uh, john mcdonough and he's asking about um there was an all-party uh, parliamentary group um, on social mobility, and they found that the system was the biggest issue in so social mobility. But what do you think, and perhaps it's maybe something that you've been discussing even in the, the doctorate you're doing as well, but overall, like really, what do you think is the appetite to influence and change the system more broadly, even outside of EY? I think there's more appetite now, so I agree. It is, it is, and that's why we're saying it's not about fixing individuals. It is about the whole system. The system is needs to be just like broken down and, and built back up again. Because ultimately, any of these, you know, mainly any of these organ, any of these kind of big processes and things have been built for pe by people for people that reflect themselves and not necessarily in the light of all of the other communities that that, that, that are represented. So I think with things like um, we see progress together, which is a which was a um, the City of London task force. The City of London put together a task force to really look at social mobility, particularly at senior leadership level, because we recognise that while there's a lot of great work being done at a grassroots perspective and entry level, so getting individuals into work, actually there's less around. Okay, but how do they progress? So once they actually get into the workplace, how are they progressing, and and how are, how are they represented at leadership level? So having those um those memberships so like that the progress together where you've got large organizations this is in financial services but it's broader than that they're really up for a challenge and and you know they have the most senior leaders of those organizations coming together on a regular basis to talk about things like process so i think there's a lot more to do but it, it's um encouraging to see that there is that focus on on social mobility more now i would say than there has been in the past yeah do you think though you know you say that obviously you know these big organizations are talking about it um do you think there's there's enough of a conversation about this at board level um you know with obviously there's there's as you say, there's targets to have, you know, certain certain levels of eth ethnicity or, or perhaps gender diversity at, at board level. Is it something that's actually being measured at all or, or spoken about at board level, as far as you're aware? No, I don't I, I don't I don't see it in in that way from a board perspective. So if you look at things like um, the park review, which looks and, and monitors the progress on ethnicity representation, ethnic minority representation within boards, you've got uh, Cranfield Women on Boards that focuses on uh, the women um, and the Hampton Alexander Review that looks at what's the representation of women on boards but actually even when you look at those it, it doesn't break it down through an intersectional lens so actually when we talk about we've made pro progress for women well what what kind of, of women because actually um, if you look through some of the data it it, it is more likely to be white middle class um privately educated women um straight women so we need to really look at actually what what are we how are we making progress and how does class and uh, social economic diversity intersect through those because that uh, and, I, and I, I am hearing conversations about that now but it's very very complicated and complex so there's definitely an interest and an appetite so I, I think we'll see more on that as the years come come on and rightly so I have another question coming from, from, from the audience, um, and I'll, I'll open it to, to either of you. Uh, it was from Louise Harrison, but she's asking, you know, you might want to change your practices, but I, I believe in her business, you know, they found it hard to get people, perhaps maybe Joanne, to be as open as you are to, to talk about things, and Darren as well. Um, but what tips do you have about encouraging people to, to share this? I suppose both as 
as a general sort of allyship and way of talking, but also perhaps around sort of collecting that data. You know, I mentioned earlier as well, we've got the question now in our diversity monitoring form, but that's not compulsory. Any, any thoughts on, on, on that one from, from either of you? Yeah, ha happy to give. So if I if I take it from the data um, disclosure perspective and sharing personal data, so from an EY perspective, we've done a lot of work, as I said, around that differential in, uh, focus on race and gender back in 2018. So that has really stood to us in terms of that um, people sharing their personal data. So we have in terms of ethnicity in the high 80s, early 90 percent of our people share with us their um their ethnicity, which is 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 really high across the, the industry. But that's been because we've built up this culture of trust and we've demonstrated what we're doing with that data. So we publish our ethnicity pay gap. We break down all of our data around pay board, around, you know, charitable work. So we're able to look at who gets what work by ethnicity, within ethnicity. And also where is that we um we have campaigns where we tell people and ask people to share their data, but we tell them why. So we tell them how to do it, because often if the system is complex, we need to make it as easy as possible. But then we say, this is what, what, we, what we need it for. So we did a campaign recently called Getting to Know You. And it was really around, if you don't tell us, how will we know? So it's very just kind of personal, not just fill out this form, but here's, this, here's what we're going to do with it. This is why you should trust us. Um, and and we're, we are, we started to do that more with social economic diversity. So we don't have as much um, people sharing their personal data on social economic diversity yet. We do, interestingly, for free school meals and education, but less for the question about what your parents did at 14. But I think it is about continuing to, to build that trust in education. Um, so, yeah, more to do on that. Um, and prop one for for Darren, but equally for for you as well, Joanne. Um, Adele Lightaller is asking about, you know, I suppose opening up um, and making children who are in school aware of, I guess, some of the opportunities that are out there. You know, perhaps they don't have a parent who's who's able to get them a an unpaid internship with with EY or or, or I'm not saying EY don't pay, but um, an internship with EY um, as well or, or elsewhere, but. What what are both of your businesses doing in terms of working with schools to have that sort of early interaction and really sort of build, uh, start building that pipeline earlier on? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly something that we've been doing for a, a few years now. We were approached by a, a number of sort of heads um, fairly recently to say that, um, can we come in and can we, can we do some engagement with, with some of the um, pupils about to leave school? Because obviously lots of uh, sort of school leavers aren't academic, aren't going to go to university and are going to go into sort of professional positions. And I think there's been some sort of kind of snobbery for, for certainly about working in retail and the ability to be able to work your, your way up in, in a business. Um, so what we offer is, is a two-week kind of structured work experience. This is something that we, we developed. Um, we overhauled it a couple of years ago because our offer, quite frankly, just wasn't good enough. What we wanted to get away from is the sort of typical work experience whereby um, usually a young person would come out, sort of stand in the corner, make tea and coffee, sweep up, and then they'd go at the end of the day and we thought, no, do you know what? We, we can do better than that. So we, we kind of provide people with, with a structured two-week experience. And what we try and do is, is to get them as engaged as possible um, and to really sort of whet their appetite in terms of what work for Timson or Max Spielman or Johnson's is actually like. Something we're also very proud of as well is that we, we stress the fact that all of our um, senior managers in the business have started off life um, in the company, um, working in a, stop, in, in a shop, sweeping up, making tea, cutting keys, repairing shoes. Um, so all of our directors, myself included, have started off life in the business that way. Um, so we, we do a huge amount of work experience and the kind of feedback we get is that it, it's very valuable. What we've changed is we've changed the way we look at it. I think going back a few years, we used to look at what we can get out of work experience in terms of is this a credible stream of recruitment? Can these young people who are coming to us at some point be, be employed? Um, are they future colleagues? Whereas we've changed that around now and what we look at is what, what we can give them. Lots of these um, people that we offer work experience to aren't work ready. They might not be suitable for Timson. They might not want to work for Timson, but we can give them that positive experience. Um, and it, it can be a great thing for them to sort of boost their, 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 their self-esteem and their self-worth. Um, and we get lots of very positive feedback from the um, experiences that we offer. 
Thanks. Um, do, do you think, is it right for us to be thinking of social mobility in terms of sort of advancement only being sort of moving moving upwards or, you know, can you sort of advance within your, your band, if you like? I, I think you, you um, I think it's up to individuals. I think for me, social mobility is about the fact that at the moment there isn't there isn't equitable opportunities for people to have the choice to do that. Um, it come, you know, again, I said earlier, you know, there's an assumption that everybody aspires to be a director or be what it would like. It's not that's not what social mobility is. You know, there are um, there are some we need people working in in all in all industries and they they are just as valid you can see um i think covid kind of closed some of those gaps around actually real, realizing that some of the things where there might be a, a bit of a, a snobbery or kind of prejudice around some roles or, or or really not appreciating the value and the skill that's needed in those roles i think some of that has gone but we need to make sure that it's not that it's not forgotten but i think for me social mobility is about um allowing people to be able to progress in a way that they want to um it's not about putting people into boxes it's about making sure that there is that that fair opportunity so at the moment there, there isn't there are far too many barriers in place for for some people that simply don't exist for others you know simply by the fact of, of where you were born and what you were born into and that should never be the deciding factor of what your choices are and where you end up in life you know that is, is quite sort of down to, to the individual and each one being very unique. Um, brilliant. Yeah. Look, as, as we draw today's uh, discussion to a close, um, I'll just turn to both of you and, and ask is that if there is one, one key piece of advice that you'd like to, to share with our audience today um, as to how they might think about improving social mobility in their workplaces. Yeah, I mean, I think for us, certainly the work that we've done through the Timson Foundation, it's been a huge benefit. So by working with sort of marginalised groups, people who are um, disadvantaged in, in lots of ways and therefore improving their social mobility, um, it's made our business a, a more interesting and fun place to work. Um, we, we get to meet lots of people who've had a, a sort of whole draft of different life experiences and are able to bring that, as I said before, personal resilience and life experience into our workplace. Um, and it's just good to sort of rub along with people from different backgrounds and different sort of um, who've got different experiences in life. And um, it, it genuinely makes our business a, a more fun and certainly more interesting place to work. Yeah. Joanne, any final thought? Um, my final thought would be um, just get started. I think all too often organisations are waiting for all of the data or all of the information actually you just you know you can get started there are lots of free resources out there like the social mobility commission that i mentioned that you can go on they've got toolkits in place that will really help organizations to get started and like darren says you know it, it makes a difference to society to individuals but it has a um, competitive advantage and if you're not doing this as an organization then you are going to fall behind because you're going to miss out on all of the incredible talent that, that exists so I would just say, just uh, just get started. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm just looking at the results of our little poll here today as well, and uh, perhaps we've got uh, a slightly different audience than we did for our event uh, on this topic last year, because um, I think we're sort of getting 24% back from the their parent was, uh, or their key earner in the household was a modern professional or sort of traditional professional occupation, um, but then others sort of split quite evenly among more clerical middle management um, and sort of then down into technical as well. So uh, quite quite a broad range of uh, of attendees here today, but I guess that's uh, the reflection of many workplaces. Um, it's interesting, actually, just a, a final sort of thought from me as well. I was reading a McKinsey article recently and um, they referenced the Sutton Trust, um, a UK charity that uh, that works a lot to promote social mobility in the UK. But it's perhaps a, a few years old now, but a survey they did back in 2017, they talked about even a modest increase in UK social mobility, bringing it up to the, the average levels of, of sort of broader Western Europe could lead to a 9% increase in GDP 
Um, so I think that's probably something for us to to ponder when we when we look at the general uh, state of the economy at the moment, and perhaps what could come from from improving social mobility um, in the economy too. Um, on that note, um, I'd like to just thank our two panelists for their time today. Um, I certainly found it very interesting, and I loved getting the 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 professional and as well a little bit of the, the personal perspective from both of you. Um, I hope you, the broader BIE community, uh, got a lot out of today's dialogue as well. Um, social mobility is definitely one, the topic you know of social mobility is definitely one that we're keen to continue. So I'd love to hear back from you if there are other angles in on this that you think that we should be talking about in the future. Do also think about um, taking part in the social mobility uh, Foundation's 2023 Employer Index, um, and also the UK Social Mobility Awards. Um, nominations for both are, are open now. I mentioned earlier that we will share a recording of today's event, um, along with a little write-up uh, to give you some tips to, to create a more inclusive workplace in your businesses. Looking forward to catching up with you again soon, either in this forum or if not in person, perhaps. Have a great afternoon, and uh, thanks for joining us today.